uh, Rachel Nix from the University of Nottingham. She did her PhD in Nottingham in Grand Country. She worked then at the University of Birmingham as a lecturer for a few years before attending in 2016. Her research now covers application of dynamic system theory to problems. Science. Now, yeah. neuroscience. <laughs> Lucky I don't do neuroscience now. And the development of new techniques for studying oscillator networks beyond power of phase reduction. And today she's going to talk us about understanding sense induced hallucination. Okay. Yep, thank you very much for the introduction. So, today we're going to be talking about using a mathematical model of the area of the brain known as V1, so it's the um, primary visual cortex. So, we're going to look at the model to, to try and understand the mechanisms underlying certain sensory induced hallucinations. So that means um, hallucinations that occur due to the presentation of some kind of image. So it's a little overview of the talk. So first off, we're going to introduce this sort of, this isn't working now. Have I even run out of battery now? Oh, it's too bright. Oh, it's too bright. There we go. And um, wandered already. So we're going to be starting off by talking about the kind of hallucinations that we're going to be modeling, to talk about um, Hallucinations with the effects that we're going to be interested in modeling. Then we're going to look at how you actually go about modeling activity in a uh, visual cortex and the sort of patterns that you can get um, resulting from the spontaneous activity in, in visual cortex. Before we're going to add some sensory drive corresponding to the image that you're being shown. And then we're going to look and see how we can change the model a bit to get some um, patterns to hallucinations that move. And then we'll just look at some numerical simulations to Sort of back up all of the um, analysis stuff that I'm going to tell you about. Okay, so here are some sensory induced hallucinations. So as I say, they're the ones that occur um, in response to being shown some kind of image. So we've got here, this is a static image. Don't get too excited, this isn't the one I'm talking about, this one's just really cool. <laughs> so this, this is a very, this is a static image, but it, because of the, the way that the, um, uh, the contrast changes and um, in the when it's viewed in the periphery you get this sort of rotating sort of effects and you get these sort of writhing snakes so it's a pretty cool image it comes from um ashiyoki's um hallucinations page and you can go there and you can see all sorts of different uh, catalog of, of um, visual hallucinations so the, the point i'm making about this one is that it's got some movement um that's hallucinatory uh, hallucinatory so the, the the movement that you're perceiving isn't really there. Okay, so here's another example of where you get some um, movement um, within a figure that is static. So uh, this is the Enigma uh, hallucination, it was um, based on some pop art by uh, Leviant, and um, which was originally in colour, but here it's in grayscale, so you can maybe see some um, sort of wavy movement within the grey rings. I don't know, this one is maybe a bit harder to see than, than the last one. The last one's very obvious, but this one is a bit more subtle. But again, where you've got some perceived movement when in a static figure. And a third example, this flickering wheel. So if you focus on the dot on the side, so you're looking at the wheel with like, like 30 or 40 spokes. If you look in the, if you get in the periphery, then it appears to like flicker, perhaps. I'll give you a second. Well, maybe they're too close together. Maybe I should have separated the dot and the, the thing is there. Anyway, don't know if anyone's getting that one. <laughs> okay, and then we have a fourth one. Um, but this one is slightly different. So here we've got uh, 120 spokes, and um, if you so this is when where you get an after image. So if you look at that image with the with the, fourth, with the 120 spokes for maybe about 10 seconds, and then you look away at a, a plain white area. So maybe look at the the F, then you might be able to see these wavy circles that might seem to rotate. Yeah, yeah, if someone's got it to work, that's good. <laughs> okay, so this is um, this is an instance of what's known as the Mackay effect, where the response that you get, so your hallucination pattern is of orthogonal in some way to um, the, the um, image that you're being presented with. So um, it seems that it's orthogonal in in, on the retina, so the image that you're seeing, but it's also a corresponds to orthogonal activity in uh, the uh, visual cortex like, that we'll see in a minute. So this is the kind of thing that we're, I'm going to be talking about where we get this um, orthogonal response. Um, 
So as long as no one else, no one has epilepsy here, I can show you the video um, because uh, if anyone at home has epilepsy, then I want you to look away. So uh, if you flicker that wheel, then you can see the uh, wavy circles at the same time as, um, I'm gonna make it bigger, at, at the same time as the spokes. So you sort of on the on off, you see the wavy and then you see the, the, um, the spokes. I can't really see it from here because I'm a bit too sideways on, I don't know. I think, I think the after effect is a bit stronger than trying to see them both together. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop that before it makes anyone feel sick. Right, so hopefully come back. Right, so we're gonna be interested in modeling this uh, Mackay effect um, when you drive um, activity in visual cortex um, by showing a, an image. So the well, model we're going to use is a, a model of um, it's a, okay, it's a model of visual cortex, but the, so the image that you're, you're shown is, is obviously given on the retina, and there's a nonlinear mapping that takes what you see uh, on the retina to the activity in visual cortex, which is uh, okay, here right at the back of the brain. So you've got your left and your right visual cortex. And this nonlinear mapping, so we, okay, so we assume that the visual cortex is taken to be sort of a flat region. Um, if we put Cartesian coordinates on that, and if we say we keep the retina has uh, polar coordinates, then the mapping from what you see, what you're presented with on your retina to what you perceive what the activity in um, visual cortex is, is based on this retinocortical mapping, which is a log, uh, log polar mapping. So, um, that means that if you're shown a, a band pattern, then so that's sort of like constant theta, then that corresponds to a sort of a constant y um, pattern. So you get these horizontal stripes. If you're shown sort of a target pattern of circles, this corresponds in to um, vertical stripes of activity in visual cortex. And correspondingly, if you get um, any sort of spiral patterns, then idea is that in, in uh, visual cortex you get these sort of oblique lines. Okay, so it's a non-linear mapping. So you can see that the radial arms that we were interested in before and the and the hallucination that you've got of the, the circles, they correspond to orthogonal directions of the activity in visual cortex as well. Okay, so it's this orthogonal response that we're going to be looking at modeling. Okay, but um, visual cortex is active without um, any visual stimulation, okay? Um, because it's already it's been shown that um, you can uh, induce hallucinations of geometric patterns by either pressing pressure on your eyeballs to get these phosphine patterns, such as this top left one here, or you can get um, a perception of hallucinations from taking some hallucinogenic drugs, which I do not recommend. But um, these top two here, with, um, Images, uh, re re image representations of um, hallucinations reported by people who are taking marijuana, and we get so we've got these. Um, these are honeycombs, and this is a honeycomb spiral, and um, and then you get what's a lattice, and um, we get these spiral patterns. This is a spiral tunnel and a tunnel pattern. So there's concentric circle patterns. Uh, these come from um, reported. Uh, hallucinations people are reported by taking LSD, okay, so stolen from a paper that studied these kinds of patterns. So um, the question is, um, how do we model the activity in uh, visual cortex? So um, we're going to call the activity is uh, U, and it depends on the position R in visual cortex and its evolving time. Okay. And uh, the activity at position R depends on the position. The activity uh, at position R, you've got the exponential decay, and the input comes from all of the other neurons that are connected to it. So here we're going to take um, be connected everywhere, but you've got this weight function that describes how, um, the strength of connections between the patch of neurons at, at point R and a point R, other points R prime in. Um, the plane. Okay, and you get this spatial convolution with this um, 
strength of connect connections function with this nonlinear function f, and um, which maps the activity to a firing rate. And so the patch of neurons at point R sees um, this sort of filtered version of, of sees how fast the, the um, patch of neurons at R prime is firing and um, yeah, that's the input to the activity. And you, so you sum over all of, all of the area that we're interested in, and that is the input to, to your um, the activity at point R. Okay, so we usually take this, um, this function here to be just, um, a, just depends on the distance between R and R prime. And um, we take it to have this um, sort of Mexican cat shape. So this corresponds to having uh, the connections, the neurons that are local to you being excitatory. So uh, promoting the activity and the and further away, you've got this longer range inhibition. So um, longer range um, uh, connections uh, looking to damp down your activity. Okay, and we take the firing rate function to be this sort of sigmoidal shape. Um, so it has this threshold between sort of low firing rate and high firing rate. Uh, and this would be, should be H here. And this mu just describes the, um, the slope of, of this at, at the threshold. Okay. Yes. So if this is mixing areas, so you get some, some input that's excitatory and some that's inhibitory. Um, why it has to come back up again? I don't think it does. I think it just, you, to get, to get what we're going to hopefully get later. So you, you've got this um, if, without any external drive. So the external drive we're going to add later is going to be from your image that you're going to present. So um, you can find a homogeneous steady state of this, so a, a non-patterned state. And then you're going to look for when that becomes unstable. Um, so you're looking for cheering patterns. So you need some sort of mixing. So if either you can take, um, if you want one a single population of neurons, then you're going to have to have some connections that are excitatory and some inhibitory. You can do the same thing, but having at every point you have a population of excitatory neurons and inhibitory as well. But then that just makes the, the model a bit more complicated. It, it, would, it, it should do exactly the same thing as I'm going to explain. Um, but this is sort of a, a nice, nice, more simple model, yeah, so, um, good. Right, okay, so the great insight of um, Erwin Trout and Cowan in 1979 was that these um, neural field pattern, neural field equations, um, when you take look for an instability of the homogeneous steady state that I was just talking about, you can get instability of these double, doubly periodic patterns. So you look for patterns on a lattice, and you get stripes in all directions. You get these checkerboards and hexagons and everything. And when you transform those back using the inverse retinal cortical map, you get back these things that look like those hallucination patterns. So you can recover quite a lot of the classes of hallucination patterns um, by just having the inverse, inverse retinal cortical mapping of these doubly periodic patterns. Uh, if you want to get all of them, so there's the sort of cobwebby patterns as well that have these sort of edge orientation um, sections. I think this one's the most realistic looking here. Um, then you need to include more features in your model. So um, neurons in visual cortex don't just encode a position on the retina. They have some kind of orientation preference built in. So they fire preferentially to um, edges in a certain orientation and um, make maps about um, what positions have which pre preference for which um, which uh, orientation. And if you include that in your connectivity function, so now your activity depends on the position and the orientation preference. If you include that in your connectivity function, then you can, um, a similar analysis will, will recover these spontaneous patterns with these edge features, and you can recover all of the, the types of hallucinations that have been reported. Okay, so that's sort of an aside. Um, we're not going to have any um, uh, orientation preference here today. It's just uh, your interest. <laughs> okay, so um, 
we're going to, I'm just going to go through how you, you do the linear analysis for um, a neural field model, because I wasn't sure if anyone here would be a particularly expert in of, um, neural field models. So I thought it just might be useful to review, because you're probably more used to seeing Turing patterns appearing in reaction diffusion systems. Okay, but it's basically similar. Um, so you start off, you look at your homogeneous steady state. So on unpatterned states, so U0 is just a constant. So you're just solving um, this equation here, where um, the W hat is just the Fourier transform of the connectivity function that you've chosen. So that's that Mexican hat thing. And um, if we let this uh, W naught W hat at zero be equal to zero, so that corresponds to having a sort of an equal amount of inhibitory um, input as excitatory input, then we can just put our um, homogeneous steady state at zero. It doesn't matter if you don't do that, it just makes all the computationally stuff comes later just a bit more messy. Um, so you might as well, without loss of generality, just put it at zero. Okay, so then you want to do your, uh, your linearizing, you're just going to linearize about that steady state. And you get the linear equation for the perturbations, and from that you recover your um, your dispersion relation. Okay, by assuming that you're looking for these plane wave solutions. Okay, so these start to grow when this lambda is um, goes passes through zero. But you must what you're going to note is that the, this condition um, means that the um, the eigenvalues are always going to be real. So you're not going to get any dynamic instability, you only get static instabilities to stationary patterns. So you get a pattern state with a wave vector k when um, this lambda is positive. Okay, so here is the what the um, Fourier transform of the, uh, the the connectivity function looks like. So it has its maximum at some at some value of k. And as you vary say here the um the slope of the firing rate function at the threshold uh this changes this this corresponds to this f prime um b beta c here is, is just proportional to u c it's just uh, they're proportional so if you um increase beta c so you increase the steepness then you're going to decrease this one over F prime, which is going to bring that line down. And so then you're going to have this uh, band of unstable wave numbers around the um, around KC. So you're going to get patterns with wave number KC growing. And then if you restrict to these W periodic lattices, you get these things growing. There's a gratuitous picture of a, a hexagonal time pattern. Okay, so it's just representing that you get the geometric patterns growing with this uh, particular value of the wave. Uh, wave number. Okay, so as another aside, another interesting thing, um, it's not very um, neuro interesting in neuroscientists here, I don't think, but um, what you can get is if you choose a different uh, sort of connectivity function, you can actually get um, the Fourier transform to have these two peaks, so now you're exciting two different modes, and if you make them not incommensurate, then you can get these quasi-patterns evolving as well. So if you're interested in just these, these systems from a purely pattern formation sort of perspective, then these neural field models will basically do anything that any other pattern forming system would. So you can get these quasi patterns out and they're just quite pretty. And then you can put it back in the uh, inverse retinocortical mapping and see what that might look like as a as a hallucination pattern. And this is just a quarter of that, so this is a century position. Um, quarter of, of what you would perceive. Anyway, that's not my work. I just thought it's pretty. <laughs> work of my co-authors. Okay, right. Okay, so you've got this system that without any drive, what can be brought to a, a, a instability where it wants to form a pattern with a certain wave, a certain wave number. Okay, but if you want to then add an um, input from some external image that you're being shown, so that's forcing with some um, some other wave number, then um, the, the two input, so the, what the system wants to, sort of, uh, the pattern the system wants to make and what you're being shown, um, 
you have to sort of, uh, what's the word? That's, they're gonna, they're gonna, uh, the input pattern is going to affect what, what you perceive because you've got to look at um, how the two are interacting, right? There's gonna be interactions, that's the word I was looking for, between the, active, the spontaneous activity and the input. Okay, so this is what the um, uh, psychophysicists call Philip and Sal. They did some experiments to um, see if they showed a pattern, a small seed pattern, either in the periphery or the center of someone's vision, whether um, what they thought would happen would be that the um, what you'd, halluc you'd hallucinate if they flickered the background and you viewed it from a certain distance and everything, then um, you would, what they thought you would perceive would be that the rest that the, um, the seed pattern would just grow to fill the whole domain. Okay, so for instance, in B, we thought if you showed little concentric circles in the center, then it, um, it would you just hallucinate all of these extra um, concentric circles in the periphery. But that wasn't what they perceived. So the, the participants in the study reported seeing instead these fan patterns. And moreover, those fan patterns rotated at uh, about, one, uh, about one revolution per second. And similarly, if you show the, show the circles in the periphery, you get these fan patterns that rotated in the center. And if they seeded with these fan patterns in the center, you get the, um, get hallucinations of, of wavy circles around the outside. And similarly, if you show fan patterns in the periphery, they get these wavy circles in the center. So this is sort of reminiscent of that Mackay effect. So the, 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 um, the hallucination, which is the light gray here, is uh, orthogonal to the um, what you're being shown, present, presented image. So like in cortex, this is going to correspond to um, being shown uh, horizontal stripes and um, hallucinate and, and the activity in, in the cortex um, in the other half of the domain being these vertical stripes. So this is the effect that we're going to try and understand by using this mathematical model and adding some spatially periodic drive to our, the existing model for activity in visual cortex. We want to understand not only the orthogonal response, but later on we're going to look at try and get this movement as well where the fans rotate. Okay, so we're going to take our original model and now we're going to add, add some external drive, which is corresponding to the image that we're going to show. So this is um, going to be vertical stripes for the sake of argument. I mean, uh, uh, the other, if you want to show horizontal stripes, that's just a, yeah, a just got rotation symmetry. So it's exactly the same thing, really. So we're going to show vertical stripes with some wave number KF, but remembering that our system without um, any forcing wants to make patterns with some other wave number, which I did call KC in the pictures before. And from now on, in all of the um, pictures, I'm afraid it's called K0, but they're the same thing, right? So we're going to be poised at some instability, and then we're going to add some external drive, which mixes the current state of the activity with this stripe pattern. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some analysis by hat by hand mathematical analysis, if you like. Um, so we're going to apply the forcing everywhere. And then later on, we're going to come back and do some numerics to see what happens if you only put the forcing on half of the domain. So we're going to be looking for this orthogonal response. Right, but because we're adding um, forcing with a different wave number to the, what the system wants, um, the patterns the system wants to make, we've got this question about resonance between the two patterns. So here's your wave vector for your, your pattern you're adding is this KF in the X direction. So we've got resonance with patterns KF upon N, where N is um, an integer, positive real number. Um, so here is pictured for KF upon two, because that's what we're going to be interested in later on. But for the sake of drawing the picture, it's KF upon two. So we've got this two to one resonance for um, patterns in the um, X direction, but if we if we're restricting um, uh, the wave number of our resulting pattern to be KX, which is KF upon two, then to get this um, preferred wave number, the KC or K zero, then that creates a component of the wave vector in the orthogonal direction. 
Okay, so you're getting this new component in this in the in the y direction. So ky is going to have to be a, a square root of kc squared minus ks upon two squared. Okay, and so if we can make that component get pretty large, that's going to force our um, our system to have this orthogonal response is the idea. So we're going to adapt some ideas that were used first for the um, specially forced swift Holmberg equation. We're going to adapt them to these um, neural field models. Okay, so this is one of the very few papers that actually look at uh, forcing with spatially periodic patterns. It's more common to look at forcing with like temporal, temporal forcing. Um, okay, so you've got this system that's posed near a bifurcation and you're adding some small forcing terms. So the natural thing to do is to make a multiple scales analysis to try and understand uh, the kind of patterns that you might get at. So we do some nice expanding. So we're going to expand, try to expand the firing rate around, around U0, remembering that U0 we're going to take to be zero in a bit. Um, and um, OK, so then we get, as our bifurcation parameter, we've got um, Beta C is the point of the instability. And so then the distance from the bif where the bifurcation occurs is going to be this uh, epsilon, epsilon squared delta. Okay, remembering that the uh, Turing instability of the path of the um, system without forcing occurs at um, beta C is one upon the uh, value of the um, Fourier transform of the connectivity function at um, its maximum. Okay, so then we're going to expand everything else. So we expand U in terms in powers of epsilon, and also we're um, taking the um, strength of the forcing gamma in terms of epsilon as well. So it's it's already small. Okay, and then we make got this multiple scale thing. So we want to take this slow time scale. You can also take a slow space scale and, and get um, sort of a um, uh, Ginsburg Landau's Landau kind of equation as well with the space in it, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. We're just going to stick with the time because that's all we need to show um, today. So then your um, UI now depends on space and your two time scales. And we're going to assume that you've got this balance kernel just to make everything nice. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm not going to show you all the details of the analysis because that looks quite horrible. Um, but basically, if you uh, then gather together, gather everything that's in order of epsilon, you find that um, at first order, your U1, your pattern that you get out is the sum of these two plane waves and their complex conjugates with these um, uh, amplitudes that vary in slow time. And then you can, uh, on epsilon squared, you can solve for, for U2 and then at Sort of order epsilon cubed, you get this um, solvability condition that gives you the amplitude equation. So I think that's pretty standard weekly nonlinear analysis sort of idea. Okay, use the Fred Holmes alternative and all of that thing to uh, get these amplitude equations, which you can then rescale um, back to get rid of your new time scale. So you just your original time scale, and you would do that for space as well if you were doing a long, long time, a long going a long space scale as well. Okay. Okay, so these are the amplitude equations. They don't really look particularly pretty. The things to note are that you've got some of these, some terms in the uh, amplitude equations only are only there when um, n is equal to two. So when you're looking for a two to one resonance um, with your forcing um, forcing wave vector. And um, there are some that only are only there when n is not equal to two. Okay, so the answer that you get out depends on the value of n that you choose, and um, it turns out that the orthogonal response is clearest when you take n to be equal to 2. So we're going to get rid of all of these terms, um, and we're going to stick with this form of the amplitude equations where we've let n be equal to 2. Okay, so then we've got some parameters in here. So these betas, remember they come from the this particular shape of the firing rate that you've taken, and um, the particular type of the connectivity function that you've taken. Um, so that's where you get the, the K naught comes from. Um, and so what you're left to play with to find the solutions that you're interested in are how far from the bifurcation you've gone, how strong your forcing is, 
and also um, how, um, how, what, what the difference is between the, um, the preferred length, the preferred pattern wavelength, um, the wave number, and um, your forcing over over two. Okay, because you're looking at the two to one patterns. Okay, and this new doesn't have to be small. It's anywhere between zero and uh, two k naught. So yeah, if it, if it can go back to the picture, oh, yeah. sorry, it's too too far back. Oops, there it is. Okay, so that new is just this distance in here. So it varies between zero and uh, um, two times k naught. Okay, so we want it to be somewhere near k naught to make this ky quite big and this kx to be small to get this orthogonal response. But if we look at the equations themselves, we can look for the steady states, we can just do a standard analysis of the planar system, it's nice. You can find rectangles and you can find obliques. Okay, and you can look at where they're stable, where they exist and where they're stable for different values of the other parameters. This is for a, particularly, for a particular choice of um, the, where the threshold is, so different values of where the threshold is will give you different pictures. Um, the, the dark areas are showing you where um, here rectangles are stable and um, the lighter shaded areas are also where they exist but aren't stable. And similarly for, for the obliques. Okay, and so there is that if I put these on top of each other, you would see there's this exchange of stability here as this shape fills in that one. Okay. So we can make bifurcation diagrams if we can take a slice through that. So we take a particular choice of um, value of new. So we take it to be 0.75 for argument's sake, just to draw a picture. And um, we get these bifurcation diagrams that, that look a bit like this. So we've got oblique patterns um, being stable for low, lower values of the forcing. And then at some point, um, we get the, the stable patterns of these rectangles. Okay, so that's quite nice. But what we wanted to show was this, um, this orthogonal response to this, the forcing with the vertical stripes, we want to get a horizontal stripes. So it turns out that if you, the closer that you get, if you take um, this mismatch parameter to being K naught, so that's making the, the resonant component really, the X direction of the wave vector being really small and the Y that forces the Y component to be pretty large. And so as you approach K naught, you get these patterns going to be horizontal. And so you get out this nice um, uh, orthogonal response to this forcing. So you put in the forcing in the in the vertical direction, and the response that you get out is in the horizontal direction, which is not particularly intuitive, maybe, but it does offer some explanation of how this Mackay effect might occur. Okay, I'm going pretty quick through this. Sorry. Um, okay, so what what we also want to to get out is this motion. So you remember that the um, Billick and Sal experiment showed that when you force um, with concentric circles, you've got these fan patterns that rotate. But um, the analysis that we've already done, you can't get any movement because the eigenvalues came out to be real. So we're just going to have to change our model a little bit to, to allow um, uh, for a dynamic Turing instability to be able to get some um, wave sort of patterns coming out. So what we can do is we can have this negative feedback term here, um, which is traditionally used to, to um, in order to get um, uh, patterns that move. So this is just a linear equation here for the it's an adaptation with a new time scale. Um, so it's sort of like modulating the activity. So once it gets to a particular level, um, then it will start to bring the activity back down again. Okay, negative feedback. If we can solve that linear equation, and so then we can um, write this as just one equation, where now, as well as the spatial convolution, we've got this time convolution as well um, with this um, particular function eta here. And we're going to be using its Laplace transform, but it's easy to write down what that Laplace transform is. So then you basically just do the same thing. You repeat all of the analysis. I'm not going to repeat the analysis. You'll be pleased to hear. Because you now get a different dispersion relation, which now has this, this term in it here, corresponding to the Laplace transform, but obviously the Laplace transform can be complex. And so then uh, you can get these complex eigenvalues that can pass through zero, of, um, have purely imaginary eigenvalues, so that you can get these Turing pop instabilities occurring. So you get pattern states that um, have some kind of um, 
uh, emergent frequency, periodic with some fre frequency that you can work out what that frequency ought to be. So we're going to call it omega c. Okay, so it's just some conditions that, that need to be satisfied for you to get Turing hot instability. And then you can just proceed exactly as you did before. Okay, so now you're trying to make your solution, your solutions that you're expecting to get out have um, some um, uh, os oscillatory components in them as well. So now you've got four um, complex valued amplitudes. So you can do all of the analysis for that. And if you're really interested in that, then it is in the paper that goes with this, uh, but it's not pretty, so I'm not going to put it here. Um, because we don't do any analysis of, of these four complex valued amplitude equations because that's pretty tricky and uh, not very insightful because all we want to do is, is really demonstrate that these neural field models, you can get movement of um, these hallucinatory patterns as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is just going to restrict to one spatial dimension. And again, we're going to stick with the n equals two case because we're still hoping to get the orthogonal response as well as the movement. Okay, so now um, throw away some of the uh, amplitudes and we just get uh, two of these out. And um, new is still our, our mismatch parameter. And we get amplitudes for these, sorry, we get the equations for these two amplitudes A and B. They look pretty similar to the ones before, but now we've got these, these extra terms here. And um, okay, all of these parameter values still come from the, the choice of the firing rate and the um, connectivity function. Okay, so you can do all the analysis of, of, of the solutions of those two equations. Uh, the upshot is that you can get both standing and traveling wave solutions existing within those, those amplitude equations. And you can show you get these standing wave solutions that are stable for larger values of the, the forcing, but you get these traveling wave solutions, which would correspond to rotations in, um, in your hallucination patterns when um, the forcing is a bit weaker. Okay, so um, get three different types of traveling wave solutions, but they're, they're basically the same thing. Um, there's some kind of modulation of them as well, but that's one of three different ones. Okay, so the important thing is that you get these traveling waves and um, you can find particularly for weak forcing. Okay. Right, so the eagle-eyed among you would have um, noticed that um, all the analysis we've done is um, for putting the forcing on the whole plane, so we have a, a global forcing. But the experiments of Bullock and Sound, they only have this, this forcing in part of the visual domain, so either in the, the center or the periphery. So what we can do is we can do some numerical simulations. We put the forcing only on half the domain to see what happens. And I can show you some videos. Okay, so um, each of these, these figures correspond to uh, the, the, the letters correspond. Okay, so here we've got um, the forcing with the vertical stripes on the right. So the right is the center of your visual, visual domain and the left is the periphery. So here we're forcing with the stripes on the right and we get these um, stripes coming out on the left. So I'll show you one of those. This will open. Okay, so these are the, the least interesting ones because these are close to steady state, so they don't really change much after the first but, um, 100 time step. They just get these sort of modulated stripes on the right. So I also the forcing. Okay, I'm going to stop that because it's basically got to near a steady state. And I shall close that one. So let's show you one of the other ones. So B, D, they're basically similar. And um, here, so we're going to put the forcing um, on the, oh, I got this around the wrong way, forcing on the left. Is that, uh, uh, that yeah, that, that's the center. Oh, God, they all run the wrong way. No, I didn't forcing. The response is on the right here, so that's the periphery, but that's not the way I rang. I said it a minute ago, is it? So I've just got these two pictures around the wrong way. So something like that. I've not noticed this before, they're around the wrong way. Anyway, the, the, the forcing is on the left, so the, the forcing is always the, uh, the, uh, the forcing is on the right. 
here. Forcing here should be the vertical stroke. Oh, I'm confused now. Anyway, uh, the response is on the right. OK, so you got these uh, concentric circles corresponding to the um, uh, vertical, vertical lines in center and the periphery is going to have this movement. So let's uh, display. This takes a little bit longer to get. So we set it up near what we wanted, but then it sort of um, calibrates itself. And eventually, you should see at least near the boundary, you should see um, these horizontal component patterns emerging. And they should be um, going downwards as the arrow suggests. There we go, they're starting to form, it just take a bit longer. And they're not perfectly orthogonal because what we can't take is, um, can't get rid of the um, horizontal component completely because that corresponds to taking such a long, um, such a long wave number um, of our forcing, that eventually you're just forcing with a constant pattern. So it doesn't really see the pattern state. Okay, so I think it has now got to the, so you can see these vertical patterns. It doesn't even look like the picture. Okay, there we go. Okay, I think I've just got B and D around the wrong way, haven't I? Because that's the picture from D, but it's just, anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that you get the, the, um, the opponent patterns and you get the movement. And uh, it works on when you put the forcing on the end half the domain as well. Okay. So even more eager line than you would have noticed that Philip and Sal had to put some empty field flicker in. So they flickered the backgrounds of the screen as well as um, uh, showing the, the seed pattern. Um, but that's really just to put the cortex near to the, to bring it to the bifurcation point. So you don't spend all day hallucinating these geometric patterns all the time. Um, something is required to like bring it up from the level of the, the noise to get rid of, to, to get you to hallucinate these patterns. To, because usually noise would keep keep them down. Um, uh, so they've used this empty field flicker, and what we've done is we've buried the parameters in our in our system. We've got some intrinsic factors to to vary in our models to bring it to the bifurcation point. So they they did it basically doing using flicker. But if you actually go through and you add some um, Flicker into the, into the numerical simulations, it doesn't spoil anything, it sort of enhances it, if anything. So um, we're happy with that. So in conclusion, we can explain the psychophysics, um, psychophysical experiments that um, Bidek and Sal did um, with a standard neural field model. It's a single population neural field model, just adding in this spatial forcing, uh, particularly with a two to one resonance uh, with the wave number that the um, system wants to form in the absence of the the forcing. If we add some negative feedback, it's adaptation terms, then we can make our patterns um, uh, travel or um, travel in cortex, which corresponds to the rotation in the um, on the retina when you apply the inverse retinal cortical mapping. And if we add do some numerical simulations, then we can show that this, um, this still holds when we put the forcing only on the half space, which is more consistent with the experiments that Philip and Sal did. So what else could you do? We could add some more structured or more complicated inputs, so we could go back and we could look at this enigma thing, but it's likely to be just a, um, a numerical experiment. Um, got to put that form of the, this forcing in and do some um, by hand analysis. But you can, you can also do um, some com completion illusion, see what else the model can do. So you've got your, your standard neural field model near a bifurcation, and you add in um, in some input with a with a a bit missing, and you see if the um, uh, neural field model can what, what it fills in in the gap. Um, it's sort of visual phantom sort of idea. So there's nothing there, but what does the what does just um, visual cortex fill in in that gap? So I had a student who did a project on this last year. So you got that it would fill in the gap, but with some dislocations usually. Answer is there, um, and you can if you add in some of this uh, orientation preference so that you can look at um, the response to edges, then you can look at where the um, like global con uh, rotation of contours. So you can look at these other illusions where these lines are, are straight 
but because of the way the contrast is, it looks like the um, it's the lines between the rows of tiles are all uh, skew, and um, these this looks like a spiral, but in fact, it, these are all just concentric circles, and it's just an illusion that it looks like a spiral, but you could maybe explain that if you added in um, some orientation preference into your mapping. And you can also look at what happens uh, if you add in some drive that's varying in time as well as space, but then of course that makes everything more complicated as well. Okay, so I just thank my co-workers. Um, yeah, uh, we've got Abigail, who's just recently finished her PhD, so she had a viva a few weeks ago, so she's just writing, making some corrections to her thesis. Um, yeah, with Alan Johnson in um, psychology at Nottingham, and um, Steve, uh, um, Abigail's other PhD supervisor, and um, uh, uh, Daniele Avitabile, he started as, as Abigail's PhD supervisor before he moved to the Amsterdam and I took over. But um, yes, we're all like them, and thank you for listening. <laughs>
So you can think of it as like a probability of time. Yes, yeah, you, you can. So if you have at every point in cortex, you have an inhibitory population and an excitatory population, you've then got a connectivity function that tells you the inter in, between the two populations. So you've got two, um, two of those W's telling you that way. And then you've got them to each other into, into themselves. So you've got four. And then you've got to say how those, that, how that, that population at R interacts with a population at R prime. And you just end up with lots more of these W's. Okay. Some of them you can turn off because they don't really make much difference. I forget which ones you can take to be zero and still things work out. I can't remember which ones, but uh, it just makes the whole thing a lot more complicated. And um, it's just easier to do it with a single population model in this case, because as long as you have some inhibitory and some excitatory connections, it all works out. Yeah, the original work of, um, sorry, uh, of Wilson and uh, Emintra and Cowan, they did for the two population models. So it, it yeah, I wasn't going to explain that because it's probably more complicated. Anyway, there was a question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to recommend any of them. <laughs> Does that actually affect the top line? The idea that it's just not working. Uh, yeah, so there's sort of reactivity is always there, but it's sort of kept out of your perception by sort of noise effects and all the goings on around well, and stuff. So if you if you completely sensory sensory deprivation, then you get hallucinations as well, right? So um, yeah, so the effects of the drugs and the pressing on pressing on the eyeballs is just to enhance the uh, the, the hallucinations that sort of the, the, the activity that's already there. It's just that you don't usually perceive it, right? And instead of OK, I said that empty field flicker is one of the things that will bring it, bring you up to this previous bifurcation so you can actually um, get these patterns. Um, what was I saying? Um, yeah, so instead of doing that, we so that's what they did in the experiments, and we're just changing this firing rate steepness as, as a bifurcation parameter that's sort of within the system already. Well, the original original experiments, um, yeah, a long time ago, but not the Billiken experience in Billiken style. They just put people in front of a computer screen. So I think that's a bit more safe. <laughs> it was like 2008. I don't think you get, get away with that anymore. <laughs> well, I just asked if you really like it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, th I think <laughs> they just asked people what, what they I think it's it's well known that you get these human patterns of hallucinations, and there's been like cave paintings and stuff. Lots of pictures yeah, of hallucinations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one, one more question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when when you uh, this extra couple of equations, you have the the dynamics. Yeah. So, so the adaptation so thing. So is this equation? Specifically, the effect of, of some uh, delay. Um, what, what is the, uh, it's, a, it's a feedback term. Okay, so we get some negative feedback. So this this adaptation term is adapting to to decrease the activity once you reach sort of a sort of a threshold. So um, set by this the interaction set by this g. Does that, does that sort of make sense? The, Oh, we're running over. Back again, right? Very well. Yeah, shut this down there. 